Thank you, uh, panelists and attendees, for coming today. Um, really, uh, really pleased. And uh, just a good evening to everyone. It's a real pleasure to be welcoming you all to this ECAN event. Um, tonight's panel discussion is going to be a discussion with a series of excellent speakers on the prospects of cannabis reform in Malta. And my name is Katja Kowalski, and I'm the Stakeholder Engagement Officer at VoltFast. And VoltFast is a UK-based drug policy nonprofit uh, think tank um, and advocacy organization, and we're focused on evidence-based drug policy. And this event is run under our European Cannabis Advocacy Network, ECAN. Um, and VoltFast runs this bespoke communications network for cannabis advocates um, across Europe as a way to stay connected to each other um, whilst increasing the momentum for reform. Um, and ECAN's got members from over 15 European countries and in line with the network's values, ECAN holds events uh, to discuss the state of reform across Europe um, and also kind of discussing how best to approach change. And tonight's event is held in partnership with Relief Malta, who is a member of ECAN and a community-based NGO to promote evidence-based education and a more human rights-based regulatory approach to the consumption, cultivation, and sharing of cannabis in Malta. And tonight's discussion is particularly timely as Malta is currently on the cusp of major cannabis reform, uh, with the Maltese government publishing a white paper to decriminalize cannabis on March 30th. Um, and this document's outlined a detailed proposal for the decriminalization of cannabis. Um, and this will be a central focus of tonight's panel discussion. Um, as you know, like most countries, cannabis reform in Malta is a difficult field to navigate. Um, and data indicates that the majority of drug law offenses in Malta are related to possession and most of which are related to cannabis. Um, oh. I think, oh, I think Daniel's just arrived. Sorry, I'll just um, promote Daniel to being a panelist. <laughs> um, sorry for that pause. Um, just give that a second. Um, welcome, Daniel. <laughs> um, I'll just continue. Um, hi, hi, Daniel. <laughs> sorry for being a bit late. No worries. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for joining. Um, sorry, I just I've just started speaking. You're about um, a minute into it, so no worries at all. <laughs> Thank um, you. So uh, yeah, as I was saying, uh, cannabis reform in Malta is a difficult field to navigate, um, and Mal the Maltese government passed a law in 2015 which aimed to rehabilitate rather than imprison people that are found with small quantities of drugs. Um, but the law doesn't apply to individuals caught within a 100 meter perimeter of a school, youth club, or any place where young people habitually meet, um, which means that current laws are doing very little to protect young people. However, the prospects have started to look up from February 2021, where there were calls to change particular clauses to Malta's drug laws. And now with the white paper out, it leaves Malta in a really promising position with kind of a nod of approval to see, uh, to see change. Um, but the road does remain difficult ahead, but there's clearly appetite for action and legislative change could hold promise. Um, and so given these political developments, tonight's discussion and event is an excellent opportunity to discuss human rights, cannabis cultivation, and the prospects for national policy reform. And this event will be focused on shedding lights on both the prospects and the barriers to reform, raising awareness and opening up this momentum for discussion. Um, and I'd like to kind of go on and introduce our fantastic panelists. We've got an excellent panel of speakers today. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce everyone. Um, so firstly, we have Andrew Bonello, who is the president of Relief Malta. And since 2019, he's worked tirelessly to represent the voices of cannabis consumers in Malta by promoting a more just, humane and non-criminal approach. Andrew has been actively meeting various local actors and international experts to discuss issues related to cannabis, human rights, and public health. And in the year 2021, he's looking forward to introducing a decriminalized system, one of which includes the rights to self-cultivate cannabis, the expungement of criminal records, and the introduction of a social equity program. Um, our next panelist is Claudette Boutegic, who has entered the political arena 
in September 2012 and was elected into the parliament in March uh, 2013. She has worked closely with NGOs, associations and unions focused on the more vulnerable members of society. And in 2015, in January, Claudette was appointed Shadow Minister for Health and became a member of the Parliamentary Health Committee, an interparliamentary group on diabetes. In June uh, 2017, she was appointed Deputy Speaker. And after shadowing citizen rights, civil liberties and equality, Claudette was appointed to the Shadow Social Policy with a focus on family and drug addiction. Um, our next speaker is Liam Ak Aksisa, who is the president of the National Youth Council of Malta, or KNZ, which represents all youths in Malta, Gozo, on a national and international level. And in 2019, KNZ and the National Youth Agency commissioned research to gauge young people's opinions on the legalization of cannabis for recreational use and has since been advocating for a system change which does not criminalize users and reflects present day scientific facts. Um, our next panelist is Rafael Vassalo, and uh, Rafael has been working in Maltese print media since 1995, starting out as a features writer with the Malta Independent and eventually becoming deputy editor of the Sunday edition. And after obtaining an MA in journalism from Cardiff University in 2006, he moved on to his present position today at Malta today. Uh, and throughout this time, he has maintained a regular opinion on the column, uh, opinion columns, focusing on a wide range of topics, including politics, the environment, human rights, and not the least, Malta's drug situation, with a particular emphasis on the social aspects of the country's traditionally punitive approach to this phenomenon. Um, our next panelist is Daniel Mikalev, who is the deputy leader party affairs of the Labour Party in Malta, who was elected in July 2020, uh, previously occupying roles of party president and the, pre uh, the president of the party's youth section. Uh, Daniel has been at the forefront of, progress of the progressive agenda, both nationally and within the Labour Party. And he's advocated for the legalization of cannabis and also launched a public consultation process, which the Labour Party as a stakeholder is holding in relation to the announced uh, white paper. And our last panelist uh, is Desiree, Dr. Desiree Attard, um, and she is a lawyer, legislative drafter and human rights activist based in Malta. And for, for the past five years, she has been leading, leading the legal team within the Ministry for Equality, um, responsibility responsible for uh, Malta's leap in the LGBTIQ plus rights and has pushed forward various important <coughs> legal reforms. Um, and she's also forms part of the Maltese government's working group within cannabis reform and is currently and actively engaging with stakeholders in this sector. Um, so yeah, I'd like to welcome all of our panelists. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Um, just to let attendees know, we will be holding a 20 minute Q&A session towards the end of the event. So if you do have any questions for panelists throughout um, the discussion, feel free to put them in the question and answer box and we'll try and answer as many of them as them we can but at, uh, towards the end of the session. Um, but now, as I feel like I've been speaking at everyone for ages, <laughs> I would like to ask our panelists to give some initial statements and a brief introductory statement on tonight's topic in regards to um, where do you stand in regards to Malta's cannabis laws. And after this, we'll kind of move into a panel discussion. But perhaps if I could ask Andrew to go first and um, give his stance. Well, hi, everybody. And um, thank you to the panelists for turning up. It's great. We have a great bunch of people. I think we're going to have some fun. Um, uh, I would just like to start off with um, these two words, human rights. Um, and I'll say it again, human rights, because this is what um, the topic is all about. Um, we're talking about the right to health, um, the right to privacy, and of course, the rights to personal development. All these rights are tampered with um, for consuming, uh, cultivating, or sharing the cannabis plant at the moment. So it seems like we're taking a new direction, finally. <clears throat> we're very proud to have um, seen in the white paper um, things that have come out which actually deal with these subjects uh, because this is the basis um, of, of what needs to be corrected. Um, I think any reform should be based on correction 
uh, and also made from the bottom up, not the top down. So um, the signals are very good uh, from what I can, um, from, from what we've um, understood. Of course, it's not a billet. Um, some things can be um, taken away and some things can be added. That's the, the, the government's prerogative. Um, but it seems to be quite a fair um, play, as in you can write in and give your opinion. Everyone is um, invited to participate, which is um, great. We'll be doing so probably at the very end because we do a lot of research before we um, put our things in. Um, cannabis is the, the, the most you know, consumed illegal substance um, in the world. Um, and, and, and this is directly just giving on a silver platter this market to, to the underworld. <clears throat> um, the underworld obviously take advantage of this um, by supplying the consumers and with their profits then go on to invest in, into other criminal activities uh, like, such as human trafficking, the weapons trade, uh, and, and, and some very bad things. And this is all common knowledge, but never really seems to get discussed. I mean, what we see in the press, especially in Malta, is <clears throat> the people getting um, busted for, for, for consumption or sometimes trafficking, but, you know, the trafficking laws in Malta until not very long ago, I mean, passing a joint to another person was considered trafficking. Uh, you know, you need to look into all these cases to see what's really going on. Um, <clears throat> Obviously, back in 2015, we saw a change. Um, I'll just backtrack a little bit. Um, it, it was this the, the Labour Party in 2013, just before the election, that had um, come up with the, the, the phrase decriminalization um, of cannabis. There were two things on the agenda when it came to civil liberties, and that was that and the LGBT um, reform uh, or, or, or laws. Um, the, the, the LGBT laws um, w were a massive success. Uh, it didn't happen overnight, but they were a massive success, so much so that um, we, are, we even got the gold standard star from, from the United Nations. Um, unfortunately, when it came to cannabis, things didn't move much, or if at all. Um, in 2015, we had what we thought um, was going to be what is happening now, basically, uh, but uh, it was it, it was beaten down by uh, basically the the other side. I like to say, you know, um, of course, you, you put the, the police force and you put the um, addiction services um, together with the, the the church and and some other sort of conservative-minded people. Um, they managed to beat it down, and so we just ended up with sort of the, the depenalization. Uh, we can call it definitely not decriminalization, but a sort of semi depenalization of up to 3.5 grams of cannabis and um, possession. But you still were then, uh, the, the police still had the right to, to arrest um, and interrogate for up to 48 hours. This is for, for under 3.5 grams. Anything yeah. over that then um, would be uh, fall back into the older law. Um, this uh, since 2015 till now, we've seen many things happening. You know, we've seen many people obviously getting arrested. Um, you know, we've seen, we've seen violence from um, criminalized criminal organizations. You know, we've had bombs going off as well. You know, it's, it, it, it's um, all linked to, to you know, drugs at the end of the day, because that's what gives them the money to, to keep going. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I think that now, fast forward to 2021 and this white paper, and I, I'm very much convinced that we're on the right road. I'm seeing a bottom-up approach. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually envisaging, envisaging um, what the, the naysayers are, are, are concerned about, which is, which is public health, you know. Um, <clears throat> I'm envisaging a, a, a very positive public health outcome, as in I would see benefits, you know. Uh, we've seen this happen in other countries. I just read a study, funny enough today, that sort of violent crime goes down, um, general crime of, of uh, drug barons, <clears throat> you've taken away this opportunity from them. Um, we see at, at the lower level, we see less people consuming <clears throat> or binge drinking on alcohol. Uh, we see we've even, um, there's even some studies that saying that even tobacco use is used less, um, thanks to that, that would be a regulated market. So. As we're on the way to there, I can just see um, only positive things happening from now on.
Great. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for that introduction and looking forward to kind of uh, continuing the discussion forward tonight. Uh, Claudette, would you like to give a, a brief statement um, around the topic uh, of tonight and kind of um, what your introductory thoughts are before we move into a panel discussion? Yes, of course. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you very, very much for inviting me. Um, it, it's great for me to be here today and I'm looking forward to learning more because I think this is a, a process which um, has already taught me a lot and I'm, I'm very open. Those who know me know how much I'm open to discussing. So just to put everyone into the picture, um, <clears throat> the minute the white paper was published, uh, Dr. Bernard Gregg, who's the leader of the opposition and uh, the PN leader, put together a working group, which includes a number of MPs, um, PN officials. Um, the theme is, I would say, intergenerational. Um, there's a cross-section of uh, age groups, and it's a very interesting group of people. And we have embarked on a consultative process with all stakeholders. So um, this has been keeping us very, very busy uh, ever since the white paper was published. Um, so far, we've met a very um, good number of NGOs, organizations, even individuals, um, including some members on, on this panel as well. Um, we've met people and we, we still have some, some other people to meet before we close our um, consultative period. Um, we've met a, a whole cross-section of people from the whole spectrum, you know, people in favor, people against, all sorts of things. Um, if I may immediately, you know, get, get to the crux of some of the feedback we, we're getting, I think the main, main criticism is coming uh, towards the paper itself, as in it is uh, a poorly written document. Um, I, I am a part-time lecturer myself, and you know when I when I go back um, to the reference section of, of this document, I, I I find it it lacks tremendously. Um, you know there are references which are not even authored, and that's totally unacceptable. Um, there's reference in the documents, for instance, to uh, I don't know, for instance, that there have been several studies and these studies are, are not really mentioned at all. I think that's after three years or so that um, the government has been uh, promising such a document. I think we were expecting something better, better in, in quality. It's not that you have to agree or disagree with everything that is written, but um, it, does, it does lack um, that uh, aspect of, of quality that was expected. Um, from the NGOs and, and the associations uh, and the people we've spoken to, um, hardly anybody was consulted before writing this uh, document. Um, also, there's reference to experts, um, but um, no names were given. The document absolutely has no, no list of names of people. Who, who were actually involved in the writing. But, but all that being said, and also there's a lack of clarity, there are moments when uh, the document itself actually um, also tends to contradict itself. Um, but I, I don't want to just you know, look at, at that side. Um, from a political point of view, I could make the argument which a lot have made that you know, this is a smoke screen to distract us from other things which are happening in the law courts, you know, the stories which are coming out, um, which are of an embarrassment to, to the government. But all that being said, there are good things, and I, I would like to focus on those tonight. So the good thing is, here we are, we are discussing a subject which I think deserves to be discussed. Absolutely. And I think this is a, a good step forward. Um, do we need a reform? Yes, we do. Um, do we need to discuss the how and the why? And oh yes, definitely. Um, I think one of the things which I, I really agree with in the document is the aspect, and I think across the board, everybody seems to agree with this, is the aspect of education. I think we are in 2021 and scaremongering is definitely not an option. We cannot keep telling our young uh, younger generations, you know, drugs will kill you because they try them, they don't kill them. So, you know, 
the argument falls flat on its face. So, you know, we really need to uh, speak the truth about, um, about drugs, um, especially um, not, just, not just cannabis, but, but um, all drugs. I think um, honesty is, is the key word here. We cannot, we cannot keep telling, you know, these um, stories um, which today make absolutely no sense when, you know, young people have access to, to all sorts of information online. And, and you know, you, you just can't keep, you know, selling this complete uh, wrong or complete uh, right uh, um, story, you know. Things are, we all know that things are not completely, you know, black or white. So, so I think this is an, an important step forward. Um, I am the only member of the panel here um, who is also a member of parliament. So um, I also was one of the members of parliament to vote in the 2015 um, uh, changes. I think it was a step forward. There's nothing wrong with revisiting a law. This is something which we do regularly in Parliament. Um, and, and I think that when a law, we like to say that the law is alive, no? But laws change because things change. Sometimes um, the changes which take place uh, are not always a result of the changes which are going on, but maybe we didn't do the things right in the first place. So. I, I don't know, maybe maybe the 2015 uh, law deserves as a first step to be revisited. Um, and, and then we start building further and further and further. Um, I know that, you know, this is not something which uh, you can be totally in favor, totally against and full stop, you know, and uh, hooray, hooray, that's it, we're done. Uh, there, there are um, things which are evolving all the time, and I, for one, have a lot to learn. So, you know, I'm here open-mindedly to, to, you know, do exactly that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to touching on a bunch of those points later this evening. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, next, if uh, Liam, if you'd like to uh, make a short statement. Yes, well, so right off the bat, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it's always good to have a bit of a youth perspective as well in these discussions. Um, I think I may be the youngest person on the panel, not making any broad assumptions. But um, <laughs> so um, basically, with respect to stance on current legislation, the National Youth Council undertook a study to gauge young people's views on cannabis. It tends to be this rhetoric that um, young people, so which is an age group which covers between 13 to 35 year olds. So it's quite a large age group. And there's this rhetoric that young people tend to be either totally on board cannabis, that there's a cannabis culture, which is um, basically evident within this demographic. And we were quite surprised by the results. And it turns out that through the uh, scientifically backed survey, there's a 50-50 split in the desire for legalization of cannabis. Now, we didn't really delve into decriminalization as a concept, we went immediately to legalization. Uh, the reason for this is as decriminalization leaves quite a few loopholes, especially when it comes to tackling the black market um, and allowing it to continue to prosper. Um, this being said, certain goals, which were also mentioned by some of the other speakers, did transcend opinion. So the need for education, proper education, starting not just in schools, but also the public in general. Um, people who learn certain things about drugs 20 years ago are still operating with that same mindset. So there needs to be a holistic approach to education, not just in our schooling systems, but also to the public at large. Um, with respect to current laws as is, um, the 2015 drug reforms definitely welcome from the draconian state of affairs, which was prior to that. This being said, and as Andrew rightly touched upon, the steps forward were minimal. And it's been almost now four years since the prison government has had a mandate to reform. So this white paper is very much welcome. Um, there's loads of positives within it. Um, the expansion of criminal records, for example, um, allowing for greater use um, for up to seven grams on personal, on your person or for personal use, which is all brilliant. This being said, there's a few lackings, which I'm sure we'll discuss later on um, uh, during the panel. 
as a council, so as a representative of youth in Mowat and Gozo, the approach which we want to take is one which is harm reduction, which protects users from any sort of criminal claims. I mean, we need to address the black market. We need to address the traffickers. Let's take the power away from the traffickers. Let's take power away from the black market. Let's legalize a system which would allow for users to smoke to use in their own personal comfort at the same time protecting society at large our vulnerables our minors um, from any negative effects which in reality don't stem from just the use of the plant but also as Andrew Wright had touched upon before um, the power which the underworld presently has by having total control over the supply of the drug um, that's it from my end we'll be happy to contribute moving forward Great, thank you, Liam. Uh, yeah, you've raised some excellent points, and um, yeah, I think it's really important to have that um, that youth uh, youth voice, youth council voice. Um, next, if uh, Rayful, if you'd like to give a quick introduction. Yes, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, as I said at the beginning, I've, I've been looking at the Malta's drug situation um, for the past um, twenty years, you know, professionally as as a journalist. Uh, you could argue even a bit longer, as just having been alive for a bit longer and having been in the society and you know, having two eyes in my head and being able to see what's what's happening. Um, but uh, my ultimately, I wanted to point, first point I wanted to make is that even from the very beginning, uh, my interest in this whole area uh, has less to do with the drug itself and the social, well, social perhaps, yes, but uh, all the medical aspects. So, but I, I'm, I'm I'm just generally interested in issues of justice uh, as, a, as a general rule. And the first thing I noticed when I, even today, because the, uh, the actual drug uh, situation hasn't changed as much as uh, we would like, like it to have changed, uh, even after the 2015 decriminalization. But from the very outset, I looked, took one look at it, and it felt to me to be, uh, first of all, um, very absurd in the sense that it didn't really make sense. Um, uh, and uh, if you have to look at it in terms of uh, or to judge the success or otherwise of our drug uh, law legislation in terms of its actual results, uh, I don't want to go into too much into statistics right now, maybe we'll have an opportunity to do that later, but for example, in the last 10 years, uh, the amount, the number of uh, school age teenagers who have admitted to using um, cannabis at least once in their lifetimes has more than doubled from 4% in 2011 to 9% in, in uh, just two years ago, 2019. Uh, so if we have to uh, uh, gauge our approach to drugs on the basis of its results, it's been a disaster. Um, we've actually, this has resulted in more people and younger people uh, smoking uh, cannabis. And I, I stress the younger part because um, I'm not picking on Liam for being the youngest here, but, but uh, we, the scientific studies uh, that we're all looking at do indicate, I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to give the impression that we're dealing with an entirely harmless substance, that there are health issues that do affect young people. So if the aim was to, to, to protect young people, we've actually managed to do the opposite. But my concern overwhelmingly, and it's not limited just to drugs, but uh, I'm going to obviously speak only about drugs here, is that we have, it has been very successful in one respect, it has successfully criminalized an entire category of people uh, who are no stretch of the imagination uh, criminals. I'm hearing something, am, am I being heard? Uh, because I'm, one, I'm beginning to doubt whether it sounds, okay, very good, thank you. So uh, the, you know, we've, we've as, as, as other speakers have spoken, I've mentioned already before me that the, the only people who have really benefited in all these 20 years that I've been looking are the criminals, the real ones, the drug traffickers, um, the international drug traffickers in particular, and we can actually mention specific cases later on. But uh, the, so we're looking at a, a system which has clearly failed and uh, which has uh, unnecessarily stigmatized and in many cases traumatized. I, I, don't want to over, I don't want to give the impression that the situation is you know, dire in the sense of some kind of banana republic, but uh, my memory does go back a long way. And I do remember some pretty serious uh, human rights violations. Um, I happen to know, I have one acquaintance who actually developed a speech impediment uh, on the basis of how severely he was traumatized. I'm talking about the 1980s, though, I must stress, uh, under police interrogation over a little amount of, of cannabis. So this is the way we're coming from. Um, I'm pleased to have to also admit that the situation has improved enormously. I was very heartened to see 
even if I were having this discussion, I don't just mean this particular discussion right now, but the discussion in Malta that is going to take place. Uh, it was heartening to hear Claudette uh, Lucic uh, talking about uh, the, acknowledging that there's a very serious need for this discussion and that possibly certain mistakes have been made in the past. Uh, we haven't heard uh, Daniel McAuliffe uh, um, but uh, you know, even publicly, the, 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 these points have, have already been raised. So it is a good time to be talking about the issue because one of the things we're, we're witnessing for the first time in as long as I've been looking at this is the beginnings of an emergence of, uh, of consensus building. We're, we're beginning to talk more about the areas we agree upon rather than the areas we disagree upon. And what emerges when you look at the political statements that have been coming out from both sides, bearing in mind that Malta's political environment, for those who might not be aware, is, is very polarized and tends to be quite confrontational. Uh, but what we're hearing from both sides is an acknowledgement that um, A, the situation needs to change, and, and, and B, that they both seem to agree that we should not be treating people like criminals for no apparent reason. And this is the, the number one concern of mine from the very beginning, uh, and not just mine, of course, but I mean, people who have been, people have been making these arguments uh, individually in isolation for quite some time now. Uh, and it's very, very heartening to see it coming from a, a wide variety of angles now, not least a very important point I'd like to raise later on from the judiciary itself, for example, judges and magistrates passing sentences complaining about the current uh, uh, legislative setup and how it ties their hands and doesn't leave them with enough discretion on whether to decide to impose prison sentences or not. And by criminologists, uh, university academics, professors, I mean, people are coming out to question publicly, and which is something that's never really happened before. Before it was always isolated voices, very easy to portray isolated voices as being slightly odd, slightly uh, eccentric, and therefore easily ignored. But it's very difficult to ignore, you know, professional bodies and people who are involved in the, in, in, in the scene uh, making these arguments. And that's part of the reason why I believe this white paper was in fact launched in the first place. So there's a certain level of criticism that cannot continue to be ignored indefinitely. And I'm pleased to see we're, we've reached the stage and we're having this discussion and I'm looking forward to continuing it. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, lovely to have you here tonight. Um, next, uh, D Daniel, would you like to give a brief introduction? Yes, sure. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here discussing this subject with um, uh, the whole panel and eventually with the attendees. And uh, in your initial question, uh, you asked us um, where we stand and uh, where I stand is pretty clear. Um, in my country, I don't want people who choose to consume cannabis to be treated as criminals. And I don't want that their only access to the substance is from drug dealers in some drug corner. So those are um, the two of the fundamental principles which I advocate um, in this discussion. And I see this opportunity, this process, as an opportunity to recognize uh, long-standing social realities, uh, fight the black market, and effectively uh, carry out justice with, as Rafael outlined, um, harmless people. Um, any one of us who, I mean, uh, uh, represents some form of uh, audience or people, be it political activism, be it uh, in NGOs. Um, I mean, if you've been around, you know somebody who consumes cannabis. If you don't know, um, you've been, you haven't been around enough. And uh, I'm sure the, we know that these people are not criminals. They are harmless people who choose to consume the substance, um, uh, but they are forced to live in the, in the shadows, stigmatized um, due to the uh, current legal framework, although there were uh, positive changes uh, in the last years. But I was very, very pleased um, uh, when the prime minister announced the, the white paper, there was a lot of emphasis um, from his side um, uh, on tackling the black market, on having a proper discussion, on having legal avenues to acquire the substance. Whilst in no way advocating for some sort of cannabis culture. Here we are just recognizing a reality which has been around not for five years, 10 years, but for decades. So we're speaking about an issue which many a times um, uh, we focus, not me, but I mean the general narrative focuses on young people. 
And that is not true. This issue is multi-generational. There are 60 year olds, there are people close to 70, um, the Woodstock generation, um, who smoke cannabis every day. Um, and they are harmless people and they do so responsibly. And uh, I think it is our obligation as a country to legislate so that these people can consume the substance, which they choose to do so, in a safe way and acquire it in a safe way. So here we're just, in my opinion, it's good we're having this discussion. As Rafael said, even until a few years ago, uh, this was unthinkable. And Andrew mentioned also, uh, and here it's where I outlined the responsibility we have um, in my case, as a representative of one of the major political parties in Malta, uh, because it was the Labour Party which put the issue on the agenda first. And in the last manifesto 2017, what was um, effectively promised was to have a national discussion following the decriminalization process if there should be any further steps. And what I was pleased about the most was, first of all, I think the white paper was a balanced exercise. Um, now, I recognize what Claudette said, and myself, uh, I have been critical of some aspects rather than critical. Uh, I publicly even proposed just one aspect, which I think needs to be widened, but maybe that will come later uh, during this discussion. But if we look at the white paper, I think it is a very balanced basis for discussion. And rather than discussion, what the Prime Minister made very clear during the announcement is that there will be a consultation period, and then the government will take note of that consultation and will move forward to legislate in Parliament. So um, the usual um, cynical or, um, how do you put it, um, uh, statements that are sort of uh, very skeptical if this will uh, move forward, the Prime Minister made it very clear. Um, we are here to legislate, um, speaking on behalf of the government, and to decide. So this is not an exercise which I see as going on for years. We've been discussing for years. And there are models which we can look at, and there are models which were successful, and there are models which were successful but also had their pitfalls, and as a country, uh, we have the benefit to learn from. Uh, whilst uh, tailor, uh, legislating in a tailor-made fashion uh, for our country, as a small uh, Mediterranean island. So I'm very pleased we're having um, this discussion. And as I said, even myself, the white paper, there are aspects which I already mentioned even publicly, I would like to see broadened, but I think it is a genuine um, discussion process. It's not... Uh, the, the government is cosmetically discussing because even as outlined in the white paper itself, there are points, and even the prime minister stated this, that there are points which have been left open on purpose so that this public consultation exercise serves its purpose as a consultation exercise. And thank you very much once again for the invitation. Thank you, Daniel. Um, yeah, raising really interesting points and looking forward to kind of expanding on those further. Um, so before we move on to the panel discussion, um, Desi Ray, would you like to make a, a quick short statement as to where you stand? Um, it would be very brief because so many good points have been raised. But yes, Katya, thank you so much for this event and Andrew and Relief, it's, it's great to be here. I'd just like to point out, even from a purely legal point of view that we speak of the 2015 amendments. But in reality, uh, our laws are still running on colonial laws. So our original, our main drug laws um, have been put in place in the 1800s and have barely been amended. We still refer to, for instance, Indian hemp rather than the different parts of the cannabis plant. So it, it's, it's a very, very low bar to, to, to start from. So this is where we're at right now. Yes, the 2015 amendments have been positive, but have they gone far enough? I, I would argue that no. And clearly government agrees with, with this. And th this is why we have the white paper now. Just um, to point out what the white paper does and doesn't do. 
because there have been some some points which have not been maybe that clear for the public. This is not a law. This is a white paper with a set of principles where government has not proposed a law. So this is very open-ended. That's the point of a public consultation after all. Um, it is not uh, a proposal towards legalization. It is a proposal to widen the decriminalization steps that have been taken in 2015. I would argue truly that in 2015, uh, the law depenalized rather than decriminalized because in effect, uh, people are still being arrested even for possession of one to two grams. So I would argue that that is depenalization and not decriminalization. Um, this is one major change that is being proposed by the white paper. We are clearly stating that the police should not in any way uh, arrest or hold persons who have been found in possession of a specified amount of grams of cannabis. So that is a huge change. But well and truly beyond what is legal, I think what is needed and what is happening is a complete shift in the way we look at drugs and drug consumers. This, this thought of having uh, consumers being criminalized has to change for us to change uh, not only the laws again, but also policy and the way we speak about drugs and the way we act on drugs. So if the concern is truly public health and the common good, we cannot uh, continue to rely on the criminal law system. We need to move past that. But that's just my thought, of course, it's not, it's not government's message so far, but there is this, this change that is happening and I'm, I'm really happy to see it going this way. Thank you. Um, yeah, and you've raised some excellent points, and I think um, I think uh, many of us uh, many of us share your um, your opinions. Um, now, I guess to start off our um, our panel discussion, I think it would be great to start off by talking about a little bit about the spark to um, kind of want to amend uh, our uh, the Maltese drug laws, which was sparked on Valentine's Day um, with the arrest of a young couple for smoking cannabis in their hotel room. And they were in possession of less than 3.5 grams. Um, and this news really sparked some widespread discussion. Obviously, there were um, kind of news stories leading up to that. Um, but kind of posing this as a question to all of you guys, do you think that we would have seen the introduction of the white paper if it wasn't for this event? Um, and kind of what has this news, what does this news shed um, in, in regards to kind of Malta's cannabis laws? Um, and yeah, kind of how, how do we see these developments um, kind of linking to the introduction of the white paper? I think, um, if I may, I think the, the, the Valentine's Day case, let's call it, um, is something that we as really um, get um, contacted by people on a daily basis with stories like this. So for us, it's a question of, you know, hopefully one is going to get picked up by the press and and then people start to get to know and then it sort of builds up you know it, it builds up momentum because we obviously as an ngo can't really don't have that power that's that's up to the press but the funny thing about that it was it wasn't even the press that um, um put that out it was the police themselves on the facebook page so they kind of bragged about it and um, I'm, I'm glad it, i'm glad it's backfiring um one thing one thing that is um interesting in the white paper is um a part where they're, they're talking about um, education and educating frontliners. I think this is super important because the frontliners, I mean, the way I read it, is are, are actually the people that would be the policemen, you know, and the people that that would deal with uh, the, the so-called crime, you know. So um, yes, I mean, I think that's what I'm looking forward to most, and I hope I can and I can actually meet with the, the commissioner of police. I've actually tried. And through a number of channels but haven't managed yet but i will because i persist um uh, because i really like to sort of get a, a bit of an understanding here going about um, what we're talking about really and uh, in fact i put out a call as well i invited the commissioner uh, the assistant commissioner uh, on drugs as well but it didn't come through unfortunately but i think that there needs to be um, a little bit education of education in, in that direction you know just go straight to the point say, so listen, this is where the damage is being done. And, and this is, um, you know, I wouldn't call it a new way of thinking, but 
uh, would just like to have a chat about it and, and see see where we can can go from there. And I have I have um, I have faith that this can be done um, you know on good terms because unfortunately all this uh, this uh, criminalization has has created a barrier um, definitely between the cannabis community and, and the police. You know I mean we uh, don't really see the police as uh, you know that helpful. I mean if something is wrong and you've got cannabis at at home you you can't call them and. Uh, you know, you, you get caught, caught in roadblocks, and so there isn't that good rapport. And I, I think this is a, this this um, white paper is something that we can build um, to make to make it sort of a friendlier uh, way to go forward. And if I just, may just comment on the Valentine case, I I disagree with the statement that that is what sparked the the white paper. Saga. I mean, it's been in the pipeline for a year now, I believe. And as Daniel said, the Labour Party manifesto in 2017 called for a national debate, which has been happening. So th this hasn't happened overnight. These proposals were being discussed with stakeholders, with the police as well, who, as Andrew said, have, have of course, they have to abide by the current laws. So I have to understand the point of view in, in that sense. So we have been discussing with them. We are now in fact expecting lengthy submissions from their end on these proposals, which will be very interesting in, in my opinion. So no, the, these, these re proposals have been researched and they, they have been in the pipeline for quite a while now. So to finally see them in the public and to finally get all this feedback is, is so good. Yeah, no, I, I, I think if I may, regarding the police, um, I think we have several examples of different laws, and this is not just in Malta, where actually what we legislate in Parliament does not trickle down into society. And I think this is a serious problem. Okay, we cannot just blame the police themselves for, for not being perhaps aware as to what extent because we, um, I remember the debate clearly on this law, on the 2015 uh, amendments, and it was to decriminalize the 3.5 grams, what in Malta, in Malta we refer to as a simple possession, okay? And the fact that you have a couple who definitely were carrying less than that, you know, and to, to make a show out of them is just totally unacceptable because there are laws which we agreed to, you know, this was um, both sides of the house agreed to this law because we all believe that, you know, we need to, we cannot have, um, you know, just a user, somebody smoking a joint for God's sake, you know, taken to, to prison or, or, or being treated like a criminal. That is totally unacceptable for anybody. And I clearly, clearly remember the debate in the house and this is the message which came across from both sides of the house. You know, we cannot. What good will it do to our society? Absolutely nothing. Will it, will it be a deterrent? As Rafael very clearly said earlier on, absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know, telling kids that if you smoke a joint, you end up in, in prison is, is, is not a deterrent at all. At all. It, it might actually increase the, you know, the message of, of, of adventure, of, of challenging, you know, um, the status quo, if you like, you know, those of us who are young, uh, are still young, but others were young one day, you know, and I, and I, I know what, you know, what we're talking about here. Um, I also have a, the advantage as a politician to have a completely different background to this, perhaps our our international attendees don't know, but I, I'm a singer by profession, you know, so I, I know a lot of musicians and this, all this talk is absolutely not new to me at all. So I can't come here and act like a hypocrite, like, you know, I've fallen from the sky and I don't know what we're talking about. I know exactly what, what this means. And, and I wouldn't want any of my friends, you know, to be in that situation, but we need to be very, very careful because the messages have to be clear. I think when it comes to, to cannabis, um, like with other addictions, and I think the, the concept we really need to focus on, at one point, Rafael started referring to it earlier on, it is not just 
the substance itself, but also the person consuming it. You know, he looked at it from um, from a human rights point of view, but also there is the aspect of of health and being prone to an addiction, which needs to be addressed. Okay, we know that not everybody, and I, I, I can see Andrew nodding his head because we had this conversation earlier on uh, this week with Andrew, and, and it's true. Not everybody can handle, okay, let's not talk about cannabis. Not everybody can handle alcohol in the same way. You know, shouldn't we at this point um, start having, you know, responsible servers when it comes to alcohol? Do we know anybody in any bar or club where you go to have a drink who tells you, listen, um, listen, matey, you've really had too much. I can't serve you anymore. You know, or uh, no, we don't do that because it's all about money, isn't it? He, he's getting more money. He's getting more sloshed and who cares? Maybe the responsible one would call a taxi. Okay, but, but this is, I, I'm, I think we don't, we shouldn't just focus, if we really want to make a change in our society, we shouldn't just focus on cannabis only, okay? There are other levels and other issues which are creating a massive problem, and alcohol is one of them. Now, I'm not saying let's go for, for a prohibitive society, far from that, you know? I'm saying responsibility. Where does the responsibility start and where does it end? What about us parents? You know, we like to say, oh, they should be learning this at school. Yeah, what about at home? We have a responsibility, you know, and, and people selling um, alcohol, for instance, need to be responsible. And I'm sure that all of you have come across, um, you know, uh, stories, at least we've had a presentation by um, an ex-user of much heavier drugs, but he was telling us that cannabis wasn't his gateway, as in he started with cannabis and wanted to switch on to something heavier. But actually, he went to buy cannabis, the guy didn't have, and told him, listen, I've got crack today. How's that? See? So it's not a gateway, but it was a gateway, if you know what I mean. So we have to be careful as to the different levels I wish it was simple and straightforward, but it isn't. It isn't. And we really need to, to really look into... Uh, the paper talks about an authority which would be making studies. Okay? I think that is the first step we should be doing. An authority to really look into, you know, what Rafael was saying earlier. The younger users, that's a, a big problem. I don't want to rant because I, I know Liam wanted to say something. Please, please go ahead. <laughs> um, no, just to touch on the, the initial question with respect to it being a catalyst, um, strong doubt. With, with, I definitely was released beforehand to, to match with the public outcry at it. So no, no doubt about that, at least from, from my perspective. This being said, it's obviously a, a welcome, welcome amendment. Um, as Andrew mentioned, stories like this, someone smoking a joint on the beach side and being treated like a criminal for it, smoking a joint on the promenade at midnight, being treated like a criminal for it. This being said, and also to touch on what Claudette mentioned with respect to um, how the actual groundwork is an actual front line is, at this moment in time, we're kind of reliant on officers being sympathetic to a situation where they're seeing someone with a joint they may tell them to move and stop, like don't smoke in a public place and just let them be. They're technically not following the duties or not following their instructions, but they're showing a bit of empathy. We shouldn't require officers to break the law to show empathy. And it's a situation where any user, as Rafe rightly touched upon beforehand, be it in this closed environment, be it in the middle of a field somewhere where they're not knowing anyone, um, it's a situation where we need to ensure that they feel safe. And then not criminals. Uh, neither the couple in Valentine's Day weren't criminals. Um, uh, someone who I spoke to recently, who was taken uh, to the depot because on his person he had a bit more than 3.5 grams. It's not a criminal. And we need to start treating these people in a proper way. Um, I think the Valentine's Day event, to also dramatize it a bit, um, was needed to at least push it to a political level and show this proper outcry for this. 
Thank you, Liam. Um, yeah, I think that's a very fair, uh, fair kind of reflection. I think it's something that's been in the pipeline for a while, but um, maybe perhaps it can be seen kind of as a, as a final, final straw. Um, and obviously in the media, it kind of it appeared to kind of move very quickly from there, but kind of understand that those, those ideas were in the working for a while. Um, I guess we've touched uh, touched upon the white paper quite a bit, but we haven't kind of delved deep into um, kind of what, what everyone's thoughts are on the white paper and kind of whether it's a sensible and pragmatic approach. Um, so just to kind of to, um, to let our attendees know a little bit about the white paper, um, this, was a, this was introduced um, at the end of March. Um, and as has already been highlighted, it's not, um, it's not uh, something that's become the law and it's uh, not a kind of a pathway for legalizing cannabis, it's one towards decriminalizing. Um, so it's proposed to um, decriminalize uh, up to seven grams of cannabis uh, to be decriminalized, for personal possession to no longer be an arrestable offense, uh, for up to four plants per household, the expungement of criminal records, um, however, public consumption of cannabis is to uh, remain forbidden. Um, so I guess there's quite a lot to unpick in the white paper and um, some of you have already kind of shared your thoughts as to, as to what you think. Um, but yeah, I guess I'd, I'd like to pose this question to all of you as to what your thoughts are on the white paper, um, what, whether it's a sensible and pragmatic approach, um, whether you know, you're, um, you're kind of in favor of what it's suggesting, um, and I guess whether we can expect to see um, true legislative change is obviously this is still only a public consultation. Um, so yeah, I feel like I've thrown out a bunch of questions, but just quite keen to hear what everyone thinks. Well, maybe if, uh, if I can, just a brief reference to your previous um, uh, question. Um, as Desiree said, I, I disagree. Okay, it was an event which sparked um, uh, very, uh, contentious debate uh, on social media, etc. But the debate was already ongoing and uh, uh, there were, I mean, I don't want to be political here, but uh, Labour government has shown over the last years that it can pilot forward uh, the reforms that it, uh, that it proposes in its manifesto. And there were some references to, the, to these kind of reforms, not related to drugs, but uh, let's put it, uh, controversial issues, uh, cut, just to put you in the picture. Um, this country was debating the introduction of divorce 10 years ago. Um, it, may, it may sound ridiculous to the rest of the world, but that's what happened here. So we're speaking of a country where debate on controversial issues has really gone um, a big, made a huge leap forward. And I think we need uh, to, to acknowledge that. And these, these singular events, they can spark a discussion which normally fades out. And in this case, um, it sparked the discussion in the middle of a process uh, when a white paper was being uh, prepared. And uh, I am very optimistic that uh, the reform will uh, will go through. Uh, with regards to the to the white paper itself, uh, I I made a reference earlier on. Uh, I think purposely, and I think it is positive that it it is a true public consultation process. So well, the government outlined a number of uh, principles with regards to uh, which may be discussed um, with regard to the um, possession, uh, the amount of grams which uh, is legal to, to possess. We can discuss if seven grams is too little, if uh, seven grams is too much. Maybe there are those who think it's too much. We can look at uh, other models which have been adopted into uh, in other countries with regards to. Uh, personal possession, that it's no longer an arrestable offence. And uh, Claudette was mentioning, um, and, and I agree with her, that uh, when Parliament legislates, the spirit of the law must be reflected in the actions of our law enforcement um, personnel. And I think that is very important not to have um, the interpretation of the law. And I think in this case, it's also very important. Now, I'm not a lawyer. Um, but also, uh, if you leave terms such as reasonable suspicion, for example, what is reasonable suspicion? Uh, I think we need to make away from such uh, terminology so that we have everything much more clearer, even for the law enforcement agencies um, themselves who, who face themselves with, with, with such situations. So I think that is also very, very important. 
Um, the white paper also makes reference, and I think a lot of the discussion, which I followed at least, um, there was a lot of reference to the four plants uh, which are being proposed to be allowed per, per household. I think in reality, this will uh, satisfy um, in isolation only a very small portion of cannabis users, because many cannabis users, they don't have neither the time and neither the know-how um, to, to grow these plants. So that's why I focus a lot on the part of the white paper, um, which puts up for discussion the legal avenues where to um, procure uh, cannabis in a safe way. And I think that is the most uh, revolutionary aspect of this white paper in terms of, um, in terms of cannabis. Obviously, um, there are other points which have been mentioned, which I totally agree with, such as uh, the educational aspect, which is also a strong point in the white paper itself. Now, for me, that goes without saying. Uh, so this may be why I'm not emphasizing on it. And uh, education is key. Uh, if you take tobacco smoking, for example, um, it is legal to purchase tobacco. Uh, with strong educational campaigns over the years, uh, we have seen that the tobacco consumption has gone down. So uh, education is still key. Prohibition, I mean, there are a number of uh, events in history and the models which we can look at in other countries. It doesn't work, clearly. It just drives everything uh, underground. And I think we should be um, emphasizing on this aspect. And this discussion, not this here today, but the discussion until the 11th of May, if I'm not mistaken, the white paper um, public consultation um, period is open, uh, is that we need to put our heads together, all of us, in order to have a strong legislative framework uh, which takes into account all these aspects which I mentioned, which are uh, part of the white paper uh, itself, but which the white paper uh, leaves up to discussion. Like, and for example, uh, very important is the, uh, the criminal record section, uh, which will be doing justice with, uh, with a lot of people. There was also emphasis on public consumption, um, uh, which is to be forbidden, which, for example, I agree. But the reference to consumption strictly in residences, um, I, that was one of the points which I mentioned publicly that should be discussed. So uh, if the residence, I understand, is the place where a person lives. So, for example, if I have an agricultural holding, which is mine, um, is it... Uh, is it something wrong if I consume cannabis uh, in the open air in my own private property, which is not a household? I'm just throwing this um, uh, just as a, an example of uh, the kind of discussion uh, which, which we're looking at, not just on this point, but on all the aspects of the white paper, um, uh, which also as a Labour Party, uh, we launched the public consultation process. Quite a lot of people have already sent us their, their recommendations. We also enjoyed meeting with the National Youth Council. Uh, there was uh, Liam a few, a few days ago uh, where we shared our, our different views, although we're converging on, on, on some aspects. And uh, I think although we need to focus all the time on education, addictions and other realities, uh, but these should not be used as an excuse to uh, procrastinate or to postpone legislating um, to acknowledge the realities which have been with us for 40, 50 years or maybe more. Great, thank you, Daniel. I think you've, re yeah, you've raised some um, excellent points. And I think the kind of um, picking at the, the details of what, um, what, e what each of the sections of the white paper really mean in practice is, is really important and kind of playing it out, you know, what this would look like pragmatically. Um, is super interesting. Um, does anyone else have any um, any immediate thoughts on on the white paper and kind of whether we can expect to see legislative change? I think it's fair at this point to clarify something which which uh, need, I, I think it needs clarification. This is not the fair the first white paper published in our country, and not even the first white paper published by the Labour Party and government. And in previous white papers. A consultation process would have taken place and then there's the writing of the white paper and then the consultation is to see how that, those concepts and those principles will become law. And I think this white paper has skipped the first step. Uh, so, so now we have a white paper which is 
giving us an idea, okay? It, it is not the way usually white papers are done. We've just had a, an excellent white paper on, on gender balance in parliament. That is not the way it was done. You had a, an, an excellent uh, a team, a technical team working on it. And then uh, they met stakeholders, they worked on it, etc. And once the white paper was published, it was then open for further discussion. And that was then turned into law. Okay, so um, let's let's not. So so this this has taken a different pathway, but but now it's here, and I'm not even going to. Going to but but I I just, you know, I get a bit irked when when you know we start changing the way we do things and saying that's not the way we usually do them. That's not at all how things happen. But the points which were being made, okay, for instance, um, the idea of, of uh, growing plants, um, not only the National Council, Youth Council, but across the board, we have found in our consultation that people are, are not very keen about it at all. So, um, you know, what's going to happen next? What are the options? Okay, but, but the idea of growing plants, we seem to be getting quite a, a negative feedback um, for that. Also, um, I think there was a question from someone on, on the seven grams, which is not clear. Um, uh, if, I'm, if I'm seeing correctly, somebody asked us, you know, does the seven gram limit apply to possession in public uh, or, uh, or at home? Um, you know, and then, you know, there's, there's a very clear question there. If you are being given a go ahead to, to you know, cultivate four plants, but you're supposed to have a position of seven grams. I mean, sorry, wh wh which, which one should I be following? Are we saying that four plants are gonna give you seven grams? No, they will yield much more. But, you know, the white paper is not clear in that respect. Also, what, what happens in households where, you know, you live in a small apartment and basically the law is saying um, the, the plants cannot be visible from outside um, neighbors cannot smell the plant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what's going to happen there? If you, you know, we have a lot of people living in apartments. What's going to happen? Is there going to be a communal system for this, or or what? Okay, so um, there there are still um, issues. The good thing is we're discussing. Okay, as I said, the good thing is we are discussing, but it's very vague as to where we're going. Okay. Um, Daniel is telling us, rightly so, it's his political role as well uh, within within his party. Listen, we're determined to go forward and 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 to legislate. Okay. Earlier on, Andrew said um, that that um, you know legislating. Uh, I'm trying to remember how he put it. Uh, is is a government's prerogative. I I disagree. Um, this is a democracy, and you go through parliament, and and that is how things are done. Uh, but uh, government, yes, uh, has the prerogative to decide whether that white paper will be presented as a bill. Perhaps that is what Andrew meant earlier, and, and I apologize if I misunderstood. Okay, so so I'm understanding better. Yes, um, so, so these are all the different aspects which are not clear and which need a lot and a lot of clarification. If I may, if I may jump in. <clears throat> um, Yes, yes, you're correct. I, that's what I meant. Obviously, the government at the end of the day presents the bill to Parliament and then you will vote in favour, correct? Claudine, you will vote in favour, I think, of something like this, because I don't think there's, no anything, to vote. <laughs> there's not anything to vote against. I don't know. I, I wouldn't be. But regarding the seven gram possession, I mean, what I'm seeing is here, obviously, a lot of people are asking questions because maybe they're not part of the cannabis community. So, I mean, they're pre pretty um, easy to answer in the sense that the seven grams uh, possession mean at home and if you have four plants obviously right? if you have four plants at home um, you're going to grow cannabis in them and to grow a plant you can't always say how many grams you're going to have or how many tomatoes are going to come out of your plant so but well, whatever grows is, um, is is going to belong to you the thing is when you leave the house then if you go to gozo on holiday and you want to take some of your own cannabis with you this white paper the way i'm understanding it is saying that is proposing that you can have on you seven grams of cannabis possession at any time. Now, my question obviously there is to make sure that if we do get stopped in a roadblock like we usually do, that the, the, the law enforcement 
find you with your seven grams or less and let you go and don't take your cannabis because that wouldn't be um, very fair if they had to um, confiscate your cannabis. Um, so I, I like your idea of um, where, where you said there might be a communal system if there, there, there were flats. Um, that's actually one that, that could be um, up, up for discussion if the three or four apartments um, couldn't grow and they had maybe an area they could grow um, communally for themselves, I think is a, is a great idea. I'm, I'm glad that's coming from you, Claudette. Um, uh, but if I had to go through the, the white paper as with your original question, I mean, one of the things that uh, I'm not too happy about, obviously, and I don't think many consumers are happy about, is the fact that um, no public con um, consumption is allowed. Um, you know, a lot of people sort of agree, but as a kind of this consumer, obviously, you know, you want to be able to go to the beach and um, smoke a joint if you want, and as long as it's not bothering anyone else, the same way people smoke tobacco. So I don't agree that there are certain places you can smoke tobacco, and but you can't smoke cannabis, because we all know that tobacco is um, a million times more dangerous for the person, and so is it secondhand smoke. So this is something obviously we're putting in to make sure, um, hopefully, in the near future, it can be it can be addressed. I mean, uh, I, I think the administrative measure, measures for minors is, is very good. So, you know, this law won't mean that anyone under 18 is going to be still criminalized in any way. Um, so it seems that, from what I read, that they're going to be very well looked after. The only problem, as I see there, is and once you're in a, a sort of arresting somebody for maybe a joint and he's under under 18, he or she is under 18, I don't see why uh, they should be going to the hassle of having their parents being told and uh, maybe it could affect their mental health. And I, I don't think it's a healthy way of doing things. I prefer to have social workers, maybe uh, in plain clothes, hanging around the skate park if need be, chatting to kids if they're smoking um, cannabis and you know, making sure that they have enough CBD in you know, uh, levels in what they're using and trying to work that way instead of, sort of some sort of grabbing by the collar and taking somewhere. So, so this is something I think needs to be discussed um, a little bit more. Um, obviously, a, de um, a dedicated cannabis authority is being uh, proposed as well, which is which is very interesting. Um, they're going to have the, the the power to commission studies. It says here, which is which is great because uh, the way I read this is that um, you know once the stigma is broken down, the, the more people can come out of the closet, if you wish, and actually. Uh, speak about the, the consumption and uh, the consumption methods and how much they consume and uh, what type of strain they consume. This is all valuable data that we can, uh, or in this case, the, this government authority, dedicate this cannabis authority will be able to, to have and, and, and make studies obviously to, to, to tackle any issues that may arise. Um, but to be honest, um, I, you know, personal cultivation and the expungement of criminal records for us are something that we mentioned back in 2019 in two resolutions that we re released literally a year ago because it was just after 420 and we released them a, a month apart and it's something we really wanted to, to, to hone in on because for us the expungement of criminal records is, is, is the, the, it's the epitome and it's where we should be starting this whole reform and that is why I mentioned before that this is sort of correctional it's, it's, it's a corrective um, measure that should be taken. So I'm really glad that th this is being mentioned in the white paper. And obviously, personal cultivation. Um, I don't, I, I would really like to know, Josette, uh, please ask them to contact Relief, these people that are not happy with this um, part that's mentioned in the in the white paper, because just that that um, point alone is, is, is making ripples, positive ripples, you know, literally across Europe, I can guarantee you. And if, if I may just... It is exactly the honest truth. I mean. yeah. it was, that's no, no, exactly it's fine. It's fine. I, I would just like to know what it is that is... is I mean, and you're saying people that are in favour of, of moving forward or reforms are saying that uh, they're not happy I, with... I don't know if, if Liam has that feedback from the youth, but I can assure you that one of the youth organisations who spoke to us told us precisely, absolutely, they are not interested. They are in favour of legalising, but not interested in growing. Plants at home. I'm just saying what our, what the, our consultation is telling us. I don't if know. If I may make an interjection on this particular point, yes. Uh, so in the study commission, I would 
bearing in mind that it was commissioned in late 2019, so figures may have changed. Um, despite having a 50-50 split with a margin of error for want of legalization when it came to actual cultivation, um, even those youths who favored legalization tended to be against home cultivation, and the, num the numbers were between 60 and 70 percent of youth being against home cultivation. Now, this was only the case if then there was a supply. So if provision then was possible from legal channels, then they, they tended to be against home cultivation. We didn't cater for questioning, which was along the lines of if cultivation is the only legal method for provision with all others and being black market supply. So that may then change um, uh, people's views on the subject. And to build on what Danny mentioned a bit earlier, and earlier as well, current users will not start growing cannabis just because it's now legal to grow cannabis. They will still resort to the black market. So one major lacking, the major lacking, if I may put this on the white paper, is the lack of provision. So um, no doubt it leaves it open to have a discussion on ways to actually then provide uh, cannabis with THC levels of, I believe, 0.2 um, upwards. However, um, if we're going to create um, a new regulated system, we need to address that before the actual implementation. So there must be clear avenues. And with respect to our research, um, youths tended to favor private registered dispensaries, which would then provide cannabis um, uh, to persons over 18. And the next favor date was over 21. Yeah, but Liam, and, that's um, a, that's that that would be called a legalized, um, uh, you know, that's legalization, yeah. which yeah. is unfortunately so, um, not what we're, we're talking about now. And unfortunately, it's getting um, conf confusing because a lot of people are talking about this um, white paper as though it is a legalization white paper when it's not. So let's stick to what we have now and try and get a sort of, you know, discuss this and hopefully more people can learn about what this really is. And then hopefully in the future, and I hope in the very near future, because I, I, I agree with, with what your, your survey says, yes, I mean, we do need a legal place to be able to purchase cannabis. But unfortunately, that is not on the cards now. It's, um, it's not a legalization um, model. We seem to if, if I may comment on this, of course, I, I have to register my bias. I was part of the working group uh, who presented this white paper to government. So of course, no, 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 uh, no surprise as to what I think on the white paper, but we have to think about where we're starting from. We are currently in a mostly criminalized state when it comes to cannabis consumption and possession. There are a number of models, uh, both for decriminalization and legalization. So for the white paper to simply say, listen, we are going for the decrim route or the legalization route, and then we will be selecting this model. What do you think about this model? That would have been a very restricted public consultation. We wanted to hear what, uh, what the youths wanted. Apparently they are more in favor of uh, a dispensary system. I have been hearing from other stakeholders who are in favor of the Spanish social club system. There is the Uruguayan and Canadian models of legalization, which again is distinct from decriminalization. Personally, I would say uh, let's not go for the Canadian model because it is a very capitalist mode of uh, selling and consuming cannabis. And I would rather see something that focuses more on the health and you know, the rights of the consumers rather than the, the profit aspect of cannabis. So there's a wide, uh, it, it is a really, really wide topic. We can't simply say, listen, this is the model government wants. Let's go for so why weren't, it. Why weren't the different options placed in the white paper? In, you know, in the sense, like you are saying now, you know, if you are talking about, um, you know, opening up for a discussion on the subject, you know, you gave one particular pathway and now you're saying that that's not the way. So, you know, it is clear that there wasn't a proper discussion before writing the white paper. And then uh, now it's coming out, you know, in a different in a different way, because a white paper like this should have had the different options if that was the target to discuss, you know, well, I, uh, I, I, I see your point thrown I... out there. And, and I think uh, this is why we all expected a better white paper. Definitely. I, I see your point, and it has certainly been a main point of criticism that the white paper does not cater for where are you actually going to get cannabis or cannabis seeds. But again, had we said, listen, these are the models government is considering, 
other models would, would have automatically not been part of the debate. And I would say that the white paper has been successful in this regard because we are hearing about so many kinds of different models, even just, just to, to mention the cannabis social club models. I, I have seen so many different forms in, in the past weeks of the public consultation that would have never crossed our mind. Of course, we, we know that there are different types, but from the submissions received so far, um, the public is actually quite well informed uh, on these issues and, and has been giving us quite, quite valid submissions. So yes, it, it is a, a point of criticism and I acknowledge it and government acknowledges it obviously, but at the end of the, of the day, it's just a choice in, in style in the way we debate. This is a very open-ended debate. Yes, I, I do recognize that. And I'd also, I guess, um, kind of moving the discussion forward, but I guess uh, decriminalization in this white paper is a start. Um, obviously, we can we can see kind of further changes, but um, I think kind of opening this up, I, I forget which one of you mentioned it, but it's a, it's a starting point and it's a discussion point, which is um, which is what's really um, what's really incredible to be seeing. Um, I guess moving the discussion kind of forward uh, from the white paper, um, obviously many groups have kind of come out uh, potentially criticizing or not agreeing with it, but even kind of opposition groups have stated that cannabis users shouldn't be criminalized, which is quite nice to see that, um, that kind of common ground uh, in terms of cannabis reform. Um, and particularly around kind of criminalizing and not wanting to criminalize cannabis users, I guess protecting youth and protecting young people is a really, key element to um, kind of wanting to see cannabis reform in Malta. Um, so I guess a kind of a question to pose to all of you guys is what uh, what are your th thoughts on the current setup in Malta and how um, how do you all see the white paper that's being presented as a way to um, to help limit um, kind of harm done to young people and protecting young people? Well, this this was a point if I may, who, which Rafael raised Coincidentally, this morning, I believe in your article, uh, yeah. where most of the opposition we received, not, not the opposition in terms of government and the opposition, the, the, the feedback received was that, fine, we agree that people shouldn't be criminalized for cannabis, but then we don't agree with the proposals which will effectively not be criminalizing people. So, of course, I, I, Rafael can, can go into much more detail about this, but this is the moment to decide where, where we're on in this debate. Do we want to keep the status quo in this regard or shall we be moving forward? So in, in effect, it's useless to say, oh yes, we don't want people in jail for smoking a joint. Fine, everyone agrees on that. It, we're past that now. So where shall we go from here? Um, so yeah, I had a point on that. Um, the, one of the problems that I see with the white paper is that it tries to pander far, far too much uh, to the public opinion uh, and not to specialize uh, uh, specific well-informed areas of public opinion, of which there are several, of course, uh, but public opinion in general in its broadest form, which, uh, which worries me intensely because the last time this happened, we, we talked earlier about 2015 decriminalization efforts, and what happened there was that the original idea, as it was proposed, um, was not the same thing as was actually enacted uh, sometime later. And what happened there was that the, the police, for example, among other things, um, made proposals of their own so that people can continue to be arrested and interrogated uh, in order to find out where they uh, bought the, the drug from, um, which completely undermines the entire purpose of the decriminalization because it, it results in people still being treated like criminals. It doesn't just mean... You had made this point earlier where by distinguishing between depenalization and decriminalization. But if we're going to talk about not to repeat that same mistake, uh, because quite frankly, had that done been, been done properly the first time, we might not even have had to, to um, be talking about a new white paper. And the Valentine's Day case, which I like to refer to as the Valentine's Day massacre, uh, which has, uh, has such a huge impact on public opinion, an important point I'd like to raise later, um, is that. You know, the, the, the injustices continued regardless. 
Uh, and that is just one of them. And as Andrew Borrell rightly said, I don't know, I can't obviously comment on the, on the cases he gets to, to hear as relief, but I can imagine, I mean, even from, from what we get exposed to in, in the media. Uh, that's the tip of the iceberg. These are sort of things that are happening all the time. But that particular case just happened to it, uh, you know, in the fact that it was Valentine's Day. Uh, it, it sort of uh, it had a kind of uh, an aura which, which attracted more attention than others. Uh, but so we're, we're back in a, a square one where we are now looking at a white paper. I tend to agree with some of those points, by the way, I mean, uh, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, there is a kind of a procedure that should be followed. I think we should be kind of uh, meticulous about it. But now that we have this, the white paper in its present form, uh, why are we making the same mistake again of hoping to hit, you know, ple- be all things to all people, so hoping to, to please the, the anti uh, decriminalization brigade by making it as restricted as possible. I mean, you know, you can only smoke in your own home. I mean, uh, you may as well say you're being driven underground. Um, what is the point of, of decriminalizing a, a, a bother if you're going to not, how does that address the stigma that's associated with uh, the drug? Um, uh, and at the same time, we want to, you know, uh, the, the, perhaps the, the best part of the, the the white paper, as far as I'm concerned, uh, where there are two things. One was the expungement of criminal records, and, uh, but it's already been said, so I'll, I'll stop there. But the second one uh, is that uh, we are now at least acknowledging, uh, even though if the white paper does not provide a 100% solution uh, to, to this uh, lacuna, that if you're going to not you know, treat people who smoke this drug as criminals, then, then you cannot, uh, then they have to have a legal avenue to, to access it because they will end up being exposed to criminality anyway. Um, and at the same time, uh, the, that, that in turn takes us back to the idea of keeping arrests so that you can interrogate them, so that you can find out where they put them from. And it just takes us all the way back to square one. Now, a brave decision is needed. You're going to have to ignore certain sections of, of I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking at you because you have to be on my screen, but, uh, but uh, obviously this is a message that goes out to all the stakeholders who are discussing this. Certain people are going to be disappointed with this, this, the, the result of this reform, and we just have to accept that. Now, uh, trying to please everyone ends up with a halfway house that actually doesn't address any of the objectives that it's set out to, to, to obtain. So I happen to disagree, and uh, echoing Andrew's point here, I mean, I find it a bit ridiculous that you can, you can drink yourself silly, you, know, you can, you can knock back a whole bottle of whiskey in front of children on a beach and, 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 and end up puking in a corner, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, you can't smoke a spliff on the same beach. Because that's, that's, that, that becomes, again, a criminal act. We're not, we haven't really, we're not anywhere near uh, decriminalization. What we are very close to, at least, as I said earlier, is starting a proper discussion. So if you take the white paper as proposed as a basis for a discussion, uh, which again, I don't think it really should be. I think we should, uh, it should have been a basis for, for, for drawing up legislation. Uh, and just to, to close on the point of how much of public opinion we're going to take into to consideration. I mean, if we had to evaluate everybody's opinion on every law, we wouldn't have made any of the advances that we've made in recent years. Andrew started off earlier talking about LGBTQI, uh, sort of legisl- the, the, the great achievements that Malta has made. Uh, uh, Malta decriminalized uh, homosexuality in 1973. And I can assure you, if, that was a, if there was a survey asking public opinion what they thought about decriminalization of homosexuality in 1973. And even worse, if there was a referendum, it would have been lost by around 90%. There's a figure on the top of my head, but I, I'm pretty certain that they're substantiated. So we have to be a bit careful here what we're actually trying to do. How many people, how many people are we trying to please here? Uh, if, in order to, to I heard somebody's voice in the background. I'm not sure that's my, an echo of my voice coming back to me. But uh, if we were going to, uh, it's a good basis for, uh, to begin the discussion, but now we have to take uh, the, the, the direction of the discussion has to be, we're either going to go with decriminalization or we're going to go with a half hour way house that doesn't land us anywhere. Thank you, I just wanted to make that point. That awesome, awesome point, um, Rachel. I think that's, um, I think that's very much spot on. Uh, Daniel, you've got your hand up. Did you, did you want to make a point? Yes, but I basically agree with, with all of what Rayfield just said. And that was my point earlier on. And the fact that the white paper references, uh, there is a reference in the white paper itself uh, on safe methods of procuring cannabis, 
Um, I think that is one of the salient points in the white paper. And the white paper was presented by the Prime Minister. And I invite everybody to go through once again the whole press conference of the Prime Minister. And I think he was very, very clear. And there are models where cannabis was decriminalized, but if you don't go a step further, which is legalization and the halfway measures, in my opinion, do not work. They do not please anybody. Having said that, reforms like these will never be discussed if the ultimate motive was to please everybody. Because this is a minority issue in reality. It's not the majority who smokes cannabis. I'm not a cannabis smoker. Uh, show a majority against, so we, we have to we have to be a bit, a bit careful in our court. Uh, yes. I'm not I'm not sure right. about the majority being against. Uh, I'm not a cannabis smoker, for example, um, but I'm campaigning for it to be um, legalized because uh, I I do not like living uh, in a society with with all this hypocrisy because there were mentioned of people smoking on the beach. You go on the beach. You smell cannabis, it happens, and it's been ha happening forever. And it's, I mean, it's not that because it's legal, you know, but it's nearly socially acceptable, let's put it that way. So it's time to legislate, to have a strong framework, even on this aspect. Um, uh, and as Rafael was saying, halfway measures, um, ultimately the result is not a good one. And yes, there are experiences. Uh, even in this country, um, uh, where compromises, let's put it that way, uh, which are aimed to please everybody, end up having a very weak legislation, which at the end pleases no one. Because you have a sector of society which will criticize any move you make because they feel strongly about the subject, and those who really need the reform will still not be satisfied because the legislator would have not have catered for their actual needs. So I think that must be always at the back of our mind when we are legislating uh, on things, on issues uh, like this, which, which concern uh, minorities. Yeah, I think that's that's an excellent point around um, kind of with these sorts of reforms, we're, ne we're never going to please anyone. Um, but I think this is tied in really nicely to kind of a discussion around public support um, and, and political support is, I think, um, uh, with cannabis reform in generally, and I think Malta maybe specifically, there there seems to be kind of a disconnect between what the kind of public support and political support for um, for cannabis reform. I think public support is um, in some ways still lacking. Um, kind of public support still stands quite low. Um, I think this is kind of linked to stigma and misconceptions around cannabis use. Um, so I guess my question to all of you would be around. Um, why do you think public support is still lacking? And do you think political support is strong or do you think there's still quite a significant amount of opposition that remains? And kind of what, what can we do to try and marry these two together a little bit and, and tackle this? I think if I may, um, I think it boils down to, yes, it boils down to education because the, the last survey, national survey we had came through the motor today. Uh, that was quite a number of years ago where it was, um, uh, quite a large percentage, basically, I think it was 66 uh, mm -hmm. percent that were against um, the control and regulation of cannabis. But and then that same amount of people, when they were asked um, if they thought cannabis was more dangerous than alcohol, replied, um, the, the overwhelming majority replied yes. So there you can see that the, the people that are not in, in favor of cannabis think that it is uh, still a dangerous drug and I wouldn't be surprised if they, they think it's sort of as bad as the other ones, uh, like the heroines and the cocaines of this world. So with, with some education, you know, and, and it should, should be coming from literally our local professionals and our and, and, and doctors as well. Um, if, if it's just going to keep coming from, from the people only and we don't have the professionals coming out speaking and saying the truth, then it, we're just going to be trying to hide stuff, which just keeps, it keeps the stigma alive and but all I can say is thank God that we have um, we had policymakers working on this policy, and obviously then it trades down to whoever chose these policymakers, and then whoever chose the person who chose these policymakers. So just yes, it goes down to the prime minister that this is actually happening. So um, uh, 
it's it's exciting that it's happening, and I think that it's it's a launching pad. It's, it's obviously a launching pad because I'm seeing even the the, the opposition um, are in favour of uh, decriminalisation. So if they're in favour of decriminalisation, um, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, so this bill should be going through, and hopefully it will be a launching pad to answer all the questions that we're bringing up. Some of the questions we're bringing up tonight, which is also mentioned in the white paper, which is a study on the legal uh, uh, pathways to procure ones procuring his own um, cannabis. Yes, this is a discussion we have to have. Uh, and, and I've obviously have my strong opinions about it. We have to make sure that, like this uh, man mentioned earlier, there is no commercialization. We can't make the same mistakes that happened back with tobacco and alcohol back in the day. We have to make sure that this is done in a way uh, which is uh, preferably, we proposed uh, as, as, as really back in 2019, the non-profit social club system, which is more than a social club, it's more of an education center, um, really, but we, uh, that would probably scare people away. But if, if, if people go to these clubs and they have all the information they need and they have the label products and <clears throat> um, it would be a good idea to not serve alcohol in there, uh, obviously, you know, your, 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 your ID, you show your ID before you go in, so you're over 18. Um, you're in a safe place. Uh, your people can help you. They can teach you. The older can teach the younger. And yes, the, the community that already, already exists is given a safe space to, to consume cannabis. This is something we have to discuss. Uh, we have very strong op opinions about this. We, we totally endorse um, the European Coalition for Just and Effective Policies um, uh, model for for regulating social social clubs. So uh, if anyone's interested, they can go and and, and and check that out and and actually find out that it's not a commercial system. Um, it will also keep the the people that want to get into the industry just to make money. And then obviously all they want to do is sell, 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 and then we'll end up back where we are right now, which is what the um, the dealers do. Great. Thank you. One very quick point. Um, uh, I just wanted to add. Just sort of, uh, on the heart, you know, I'm speaking now of, as a journalist. Uh, the multimedia uh, hasn't done a great service either in the way it, put, it portrays uh, cannabis in, in news items, you know, on TV, newspapers as well. Uh, it, uh, in the past, and it just hasn't changed as much as I would like it to have changed. Uh, we obviously base ourselves on, for the most part. Uh, press releases coming from the CMRU, that's the police's media uh, section, uh, and it would be something like, you know, uh, some age, a, certain, a man of certain age caught with drugs, and the word drugs uh, emphasized or draw by, it, it, it's echoed across the, 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 the way it's projected, and we will have no idea, of course, if it was caught with heroin, if it was caught with cocaine, if it was caught with methamphetamines, or if it was caught with cannabis. Uh, that was the situation for, for, for several years, and very few newspapers did anything about it, like all other parts of the media, like even uh, response to those press releases with requests for more information. Uh, we weren't even told, for example, about the amounts of drugs that were concerned or whether it was in circumstances that, and, and the media went along with it. And I hate to say it, but uh, I don't want to drag politics into it, but politics and the media are never too far away in this country. Uh, but these, these things are very often and altogether too often used by one party to hit out at the other. I'm talking as generically as I can. Um, and, you know, to, to create a situation of this, the drug situation is getting worse under this party or, you know, it was better under that party. So it's, you know, it, it is rather than trying to get to the heart of what was actually happening uh, and looking into the individual cases, we ended, and this has played into public opinion and public perceptions that uh, the, the, the survey that Andrew pointed out, uh, the, the mismatch between, you know, you've got the, the majority that's uh, in our service that came out against uh, regulation of cannabis, thinking that it's more, more harmful than alcohol, because of course, where they're getting their information from and how much of it is, this is a responsibility that the media has, have, sorry, that uh, I don't think they're really taking uh, seriously enough. I just wanted to make that point and get into this discussion as well. And over that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, um, Claudette. I may, yes, please. I, I, I need to clarify, especially with Andrew, who for the second time this evening has put words into my mouth, which I have not said. So I am very gently and kindly telling you. At no point did I say we are voting in favor or against anything. 
Why? I'm just because trying to convince still... you, Claudette. I'm just trying to convince you. Uh, yes, yes. But, uh, but then, as Rafael very nicely put it, we have to be careful as to what the media pick up when we make such statements. So <laughs> I am a I'm politician both. and I have to be very careful in the words I choose. So with all huge respect, we are still at a stage where we are discussing because you vote in favor or against a legislation. And I think um, the decision to vote in favor or against something will only depend as to when you actually see the law, the bill yeah, of itself. Course, of course, okay, of course. and that makes a big difference. Yes. Now we have a reputation, and we 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 like to to work on it. Um, yesterday in Parliament, I I gave a speech, and I said exactly the same thing. No matter what the laws are before us, and and um, uh, Dr. Desiree can can vouch for this, even when we disagree. Uh, you know, and and we are discussing something. We still try to make it the best law possible. Okay, we still contribute to that, and and I I take pride in that. This hardly ever comes out in the media. It is the work we do in Parliament, and I I am one of the politicians who enjoys my parliamentary work. So um, I wanted to make that very very clear, but. Um, you know, as we can see, um, I, I think Rafael was spot on. When you leave things so open-ended, you start assuming that everybody is in favor of something or that others are automatically against, when actually it's still too open-ended to come to a favorable or no decision, because there are a lot of question marks on every step of the way. So we are agreeing definitely that the good step is discussing this, okay? We are agreeing that no, we don't want to send anybody in prison, you know, just for possessing or, or, or smoking a joint, for goodness sake. I think I made that very, very clear. And I think even um, the people we've met and the associations and the NGOs we've met in our consultation process, I think even those who are so much against any form of decriminalizing further would also tell you exactly what I am saying, which is it doesn't make sense to put, you know, a, a simple user in prison. That makes absolutely no sense. So I just thought I'd, you know, make that clear because um, a couple of times it was said that I, I am saying something which I don't. No, but but so that, that that's actually being addressed as far as I can read in this white paper. You know, this the, the decriminalization of of possession, and um, so so what what everyone seems to be agreeing with, like you said, even the people that are against, um, they still they still agree. No one should be should be arrested for possession. Correct. I mean, I think everybody is in agreement there. Now, how the white paper is written and how it is compared to other white papers. I wouldn't even know because I don't, I don't read white papers. This is the one I'm concentrating on because it's it's what affects us uh, as a, as the cannabis com community. But mm -hmm. in it, there are points which I'm not seeing from um, the opposition coming out and saying, "Listen, this is this is good. This is good." I mean, you know, I, that's why I don't understand why there has to be sort of nitpicking in things. I mean, even the. The, the 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 dean well, of the faculty of social mid, well-being is talking about how big pots uh, are going Andrew, to be in Andrew, one's house. Andrew, let me tell you, um, I, I will take what Daniel was saying earlier, mm -hmm. because when you come to legislate, if you don't nitpick, a law is open to interpretation, and that's where you will have problems. Yes, but nitpick so with evidence, not... back it up with evidence, tell us what it is that is written down in those eight points, that, that it is is not making sense as in what's it so at least that way we have a clear idea because i'm trying to get to the bottom of I'm not the opposition i'm talking about the nationalist party i mean whatever whoever it is coming out against it i'm saying give me something that that makes sense that you know in these eight points that's listen i i was i was saying earlier on you know the issue of the plants okay let's let's just say that there's no let's, other let's option let's talk about the cultivation the cultivation yeah. okay the cultivation i mean for goodness sake you can't just say four plants where you're going to get the seeds what type of plants are they how big are they what is the yield you're not saying any any of that there are a lot of question marks you can't just make an open statement and just say you know everybody can cultivate four plants fine i also gave you um the issues which which 
people have been telling us about. And what if I can't? What if I have children at home and I, I cannot hide from my children the place where I'm cultivating these plants and I, I don't want them to see it? Where am I going to cultivate? So, But why would you want to hide are... the plant from children? It's a plant. Why? You see, I don't understand why you would want to because, hide a plant. Because the paper does it is, is it a bomb? as well. That's because of the stigma around cannabis, though, that is going to die out Andrew, within Andrew, the next few months. Andrew, don't, don't, yes. don't, don't, please. Um, I, I, you know, I'm understanding you perfectly well. So Good, thank you. I'm, I'm saying that if you're saying in the same document that you have to do all this away, it says so in the document, away from the, from children. So a lot of users I know who have children, and somebody said earlier, we're talking about users who are also at the geriatric stage in their life here, you know, they have grandchildren who are at home. I've had somebody telling me, so, so where am I going to go with this plant? If I can't, you know, if the document is actually saying that children cannot be in the presence of. It does say that. Listen, if I, don't, if I'm I'm not, I may not, interject yeah, on this, just, just to, uh, I mean, I tend to agree with Honorable Buttigieg that the devil is in the detail. So I, I really, and then once again, we may disagree on the way we are heading to a law, but that is where we're heading. The white paper is open-ended just to get the feedback on these points. For instance, yes, I would tend to agree that just saying that everyone can cultivate four, four plants is, is not enough. It has to be qualified. Uh, will four, four plants mean four fully mature plants or not? Uh, will the, the resultant buds be capped? So there's, there's plenty to discuss there. Um, but but yes, I, I think there, there's much that we, there, there's so much that we need to discuss on this, and and well and truly, everyone has an interest in this white paper because as Daniel said, everyone knows a smoker or is a smoker themselves, so this is really a, a, so, a social concern, and and we need to have this kind of mindset when we discuss cannabis. It's not a minority issue or a majority issue. Frankly, I don't care about the numbers. If there is one cannabis smoker, he, need, he deserves and he has the right to have a legal framework which protects him and gives him that right if he is, of course, a consenting adult and, and, all, that, and all that stuff. So we need, once again, to change our mindset. The white paper may, may also have have fallen prey to this mentality. I mean, we are the result of an education that has told us, if you take this drug, you will die. If you touch this drug, you will end up in prison. Forget your career, forget your profession. So I will admit that we, are, we have all been educated in this way. So if the white paper betrays these kind of thoughts at some point, I, I, am, I would not be surprised. Thank you. I think that, yeah, that's an excellent and, um, and very valid point. Um, and I guess, um, I mean, we've got so many, so many points that we haven't been able to address tonight just because of um, time constraints. And I'm aware that we've got, um, we've got around 10 minutes left. Um, before we move on to some kind of just closing remarks from everyone, um, this has already been kind of discussed, but I was wondering if anyone would want to quickly elaborate on this, but obviously there tends to be kind of a disconnect between paper and practice. Um, in law, laws in general, but I think around cannabis reform in particular, around like what, um, you know, what things actually mean in practice and um, what we can kind of envisage with, with cannabis de decriminalization in practice. So I don't know if anyone would like to draw on to like what some of the problems we can envisage with, um, with some of the points that have been uh, pointed out in the white paper and how these problems might be addressed or minimized um, through kind of sensible legislation. I think, um... It's already very positive that there seems to be a consensus that we don't want, nobody wants a cannabis user um, to be treated as a criminal or to be put in jail. And let's put jail part apart uh, because there was already the criminalization process, but uh, users treated as criminals uh, is still a reality. So what I fail to understand is there is consensus on this. Why? do we persist in leaving the user within the criminal world to acquire the substance itself? I may sound repetitive about this, but it's 
a very strong opinion which I have. If we do not want people to be treated like criminals, we cannot leave them isolated within the criminal world to acquire the cannabis itself. I think that is the point of departure to have um, the actual reform, which at least I uh, see going through eventually um, in Malta. And uh, I look forward to is now the structure of the white paper, the debate, the discussion, etc. Um, having a consensus that we don't want cannabis users to be treated as criminals, I think it's already a big leap forward compared to the situation we had in the drug debate nationally uh, up to a few years ago. So I think we should look at what can serve as the basis of a way forward. I, from my end, have my own opinion. I form part of a party, a political party which is in government. Now the government's position in terms of the consultation was putting the white paper forward itself. As a political party, we will be putting our submissions forward independently from the government's position in the white paper. I still, I have my own personal opinions. I form part of a party and obviously the submission will reflect the opinion of the structures within the party. Um, so what I advocate for, I will be advocating for within the fora uh, of, the party, of the party itself, but I would really like to see uh, the courage that is needed to acknowledge the changes which are needed on a legislative level, um, to really acknowledge the social uh, realities which, are, which exist. So if we agree that users are not criminals, we cannot leave them at the mercy of criminals. And I think that is um, the point of departure for the rest of the debate, in my opinion. Absolutely. I think that that's a great point. And I know we haven't, I don't think we'll have a chance to do a proper Q&A session due to time constraints, but that a lot of people are asking about kind of a legal pathway and, you know, how people might be able to purchase um, cannabis legally. And I think that's, um, that, that, that's a key kind of issue with the decriminalization model is it doesn't address, um, you know, a legal pathway to actually procuring cannabis. Um, but thank you, Daniel, for that statement. I don't know if anyone else would like to add. Yes, to that well, and I, I, I tend to agree with, with a lot of what Daniel has just said. Okay, it, it is an important point of departure. Okay, it is. Um, and, and, and I also agree with what Desiree said earlier, that this is not about a minority and majority. Because most of the laws we pass in Parliament are to protect very small minorities. Okay, so it's not about that at all. But we also didn't mention a, a per, an, an important aspect, in my opinion, okay? What about those who um, have really big issues, not just with cannabis, but with other um, uh, addictions and which will fall on the wayside, okay? The country is investing huge, huge amounts of money uh, in this respect. And I think we need to see whether that deserves to be addressed, whether the pathways we are talking about here should be discussed much more in detail with those offering the services, okay? Because they can tell us exactly what their clients um, are going through. And we need to understand that reality as well, because not everybody, it's, once again, I, I to give an example uh, and to make myself clearer, I will move away from the debate on cannabis itself. We know that there are people who drink alcohol and have a massive problem in their life. We need to address that, okay? Same thing here. We cannot assume that just because, you know, I'm okay with this and others I know are okay with this, but what happens when things are not okay, okay? And, and we need to take this further. This is not... As I said, for me, this white paper is a point of departure. I honestly, honestly wish it was uh, better. I, I, I expected it to, to be better, okay? All right, but, but yes, I commend that we're here, okay? Because, you know, what's fair is fair, all right? Um, yes, I, I can say that, you know, my party didn't bring something like this to the table. Sure, you know, but that's, that's only fair that I, I, I recognize this. But we're here to discuss, and if we don't discuss the full picture and the nitty-gritty of it, 
then we will fail. We will definitely fail. Even if we do discuss the full picture and the nitty gritty, we will still fail a few people. But if we don't, we will fail, like Rafael said earlier. You know, it will be a hodgepodge trying to please a lot of people and it will be a disaster. That's my, my take on it. And like Daniel, I have my very personal opinion about a lot of things, but like Daniel, I have to go through the party structures and, and discuss, and this is what we're doing. And I have to say, I, I, I'm really enjoying the really good debate with which this has um, nurtured. So thanks once again. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think this has been an absolutely uh, excellent discussion um, and there's just been so much to unpick and it's, uh, it's, it's been fantastic. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else would like to touch on that kind of aspect of disconnect between paper and practice. Um, if not, um, I'm happy to move on to some kind of just final statements from everyone around next steps. Um, if that would be best, I think we're, we are, I am aware that we're running quite low on time. Um, so I guess if, uh, if everyone would like to make kind of a, a final statement around kind of what the next steps for advancing this discussion positively um, and how we can kind of um, continue to represent voices of people that use cannabis and what we, what we need to do to ensure we see sensible change in Malta. Um, so I'll open up the floor to whoever would like to make a statement first as we, as we start to close. Go ahead. Go ahead. I can, maybe I can conclude, um, uh, and I don't. I don't want to, uh, in any way, repeat myself. Um, on my personal thoughts, which I advocate for. What um, uh, I think we need to be clear about is that uh, from paper to reality to implementation, and I think the government stand on that aspect was very very clear um, that this process will lead to legislation. And uh, I think that is very important because we've had, um, uh, mentioned earlier, um, we've had a number of white papers, we've had a number of discussions in this country which um, led to nowhere. Uh, there's discussions which crop up every now and then for 10, 15, 20, 25 years, um, uh, sometimes more, and nothing happened. And there are issues which are still pending, which needs to be discussed and eventually acknowledged and legislated. Um, but in this case, uh, the government stance is very, very clear. And uh, I really hope that uh, the debate kicks off from that point of departure, which I mentioned. Um, uh, I hope it does not go down uh, the partisan, uh, partisan path. Um, Malta is a, quite a, a polarized country when it comes to, to politics, even mm -hmm. certain statements. Um, I don't think uh, they aid the cause or aid the, the debate itself. Um, I mean, even referring to this exercise as a political spokescreen, I think um, uh, you can apply that to any kind of reform. I'm seeing Claudette waving her hand. But anything, anything can be considered a spokescreen. Um, if it does not fit uh, the agenda of what uh, someone thinks is the only priority. But government has a program which it was elected upon in 2017. Uh, this debate was one of the points within the manifesto. And I think as a country, whilst acknowledging um, other challenges or other issues uh, which are being tackled um, and being acknowledged even by international institutions, but we cannot leave uh, debates such uh, as this because it's never the right time. And I think that's what distinguishes also um, uh, those who are convinced um, morally and in principle of putting forward reforms because it's never the right time. And that is a narrative which you can um, read out, not only in Malta, but internationally, um, uh, from certain parts of the political spectrum, anytime some kind of controversial reform is put forward. So I, I look forward to see my country uh, amongst the few countries in the world with a strong legal framework when it comes also to us. I still think that you're using it as, as a smoke screen, but it doesn't matter. That, that's why we're going to vary in our opinion, okay? Because the timing was perfect with what what's happening to, to each Cambrian court. So uh, I will take it from there and um, we, we'll move on. We'll move on because at the end of the day- I'm sure there's a drafted the white paper over the weekend. 
No, 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 she didn't. Uh, <laughs> it was being worked on definitely, but uh, then it was published in a hurry. But anyway, that is that is my opinion. Um, once again, I also don't want to repeat myself, and I think um, um, the the consultation we're going through ourselves uh, is helping us also to understand seriously. One point which I didn't mention earlier, and I will close on this. Um, um, Andrew and Rafael referred to the Malta Today survey, even the document does. Uh, Liam was referring to, to the survey that uh, KNZ have done. And unfortunately, I think this is, this is a problem we have. We cannot compare the different surveys. We really need to have um, good proper surveys done to, to understand better you know, um, the direction we're going. Um, it's it, they're lacking it, comparing. You know, we don't have like with like to compare. Um, the ESPAD is a good one. Okay, the ESPAD is a very very good uh, survey for us to to work on. And as Rafael said, it is of a huge concern as a society that our young teenagers, you know, are experimenting um, with with uh, cannabis at such an early age. Okay, and we have to recognize that at that age. Uh, we need to protect our young people much more. And then we have to take the responsibility. What are we doing wrong in this country? And I'm not blaming the government, okay? This is a society issue, okay? Where are we going? What, what do our young people, you know, what are we offering them different? Are we, are we actually making enough effort, you know? And this is not something which is happening. Honestly, I'm, I'm really, I don't want to be um, political here. As a society, what have we been doing? What are we doing to change this? You know, and I don't think we're doing enough. That's where that's you know worth pondering about. Thank you, Claudette. Um, yeah, excellent point to end on. Would anyone else like to make a final statement before we before we close for the evening? I'll be very very brief. Um, thank you once again for this event. It's it's been really really interesting. I believe the white paper is not the be all and end all of, of this subject in Malta. And I am convinced that the, that the law that will result from this, this consultation period will also not be the be all and end all. I think we need to keep on listening and uh, seeing what its effects will be in practice once a law is eventually implemented and keep building on that which is why, for instance, the white paper proposes an authority specifically designed to study uh, the impact that this, these changes will bring about. So, so yes, this is really just one of many steps that need to be taken in Malta for, for cannabis uh, consumer rights to be actually taken seriously. So yes, I, I will end just by encouraging anyone really to take, uh, to take part in this consultation uh, session. It, it lasts until the 11th of May. And the old documents, and yes, the white paper is there too, can be found on consultazioni.gov. And we really, really want to hear from as many people as possible on this. So thank you once again. Thank you. If I may make a closing point and with respect to some points that you mentioned as to how we're gonna protect young people. Um, we can't simultaneously be a nation which confers the right to vote to 16 and 17 year olds then say that the same 16 and 17 year olds cannot have received proper education on substance use and ultimately make their own decisions once they reach majority. So, and I'm very happy that there seems to be um, agreement on this. Education reform is part and parcel to finally passing proper legislative framework on cannabis. Um, moving forward, once a cannabis user, once the cannabis community in Malta feels safe, feels like they're no longer being treated as criminals, only then can we start making proper um, steps into legalizing potentially, uh, to not use uh, the word in its full right, because the taboo, the stigma, as Andrew um, called it repeatedly throughout this uh, this panel discussion, would then hopefully start to dissipate. As soon as the stigma dissipates, as soon as the taboo dissipates, we'll be able to have proper discussions, hopefully on the basis of which this white paper ultimately then results in the law to be discussed in Parliament. Thank you, Katia. Thank you so much for, for hosting. And it was my pleasure to also be part of this panel of excellent speakers. Thank you. Thanks so much, Liam. <laughs>
Uh, the only thing I'd say is uh, thank you very much. I, I understand we don't have any more time today. It was a very interesting discussion. I was very pleased to see uh, that the tone of the discussion has changed so 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 positively. And I don't just mean again in this particular webinar, but I'm talking about the, 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 the debate in Malta is has taken great strides forward. We're actually uh, talking about the issue itself rather than the political ramifications of it, which is what we normally talk about or we used to talk about. And I think the ultimately, very quickly, I'd just like to say that it should be ultimately aimed at safety and the safety also involves knowing exactly what it is you're buying uh, knowing exactly what it is you're consuming and keeping things underground and under the radar uh, detracts from the safety and actually contributes to the horrible stories we read from time to time about the terrible effects of drugs when they are terrible and when they uh, so uh, I hope that this this white paper does result in effective legislation to increase the level of safety surrounding the whole issue and that's what I'll say I'll stop there thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rafael. Um, and Andrew, would you like to uh, make some final remarks before I, before I close? Yes, look, just to wrap up, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. It's been, it's been really, really, really good. Um, everyone had different and interesting things to say, and I, I love to hear um, all these different opinions. So it's been, it's been really fruitful. I think um, I just want to maybe say what Liam was saying about the education and the stigma. I think... <clears throat> Um, he's spot on, basically. But another thing I'd like to add as well is that we need to also direct our education towards the, the cannabis consumers, because unfortunately, what we have is an education for the youth, uh, maybe through schools and other avenues. And then we have so rehabilitation um, uh, organizations that catch you sort of once you've fallen. But uh, in between, we don't see anything because unfortunately, this, this, the stigma, due to the stigma, we don't see any education to, um, uh, directed towards drug users in general, substance and substance users. So I'd like to see this change. And I think, uh, I think we're in, on the right track. So I'd like to thank everyone. And it's been, it's been fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. And um, yeah, I'd just like to extend um, my thanks to all of you guys for participating. This has been um, such an absolutely interesting and insightful discussion um, and I've learned a lot and I'm sure our audience has as well so yeah just a um, massive thank you for taking out the time uh, to discuss this really important topic and um, yeah and looking forward to seeing how things progress and advance in Malta um, so yeah uh, massive thank you um, you guys have all made excellent points and it's been a, a delight to all meet you so um, yeah I wish you all a, a lovely evening and, um, and hopefully we'll all be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening.